In this video, we'll discuss SN1 and SN2 reactions, what they are, and how they're similar and different from each other. You'll learn a multitude of reactions in Organic Chemistry 1 and even more in Organic Chemistry 2. But the key thing to remember is that all of these reactions will only consist of four mechanisms, where different combinations of them gives you a new reaction, like SN1 and SN2. Let's review them before we move on. The first mechanism is a nucleophilic attack, where a nucleophile attacks an electrophile. Nucleophile translates to nucleus lever. It's an atom with high electron density, and this density can be the result of multiple things, inductive effects, lone pairs, or pi bonds. An electrophile is the opposite of a nucleophile. It's an atom with low electron density which explains how it's attacked by the nucleophile. This low electron density can also be caused by inductive effects or an empty p orbital. This empty p orbital, in most cases, will give you a carbocation, a carbon atom with a positive formal charge. The next mechanism is the loss of a leaving group, which you can think of as the loss of electron density. This explains the resulting positive charge on what's left of the original compound, which can now act as an electrophile in the preceding step. A leaving group is an atom capable of separating from the electrophile. In order to do this, it needs to withdraw electron density within the compound, and it needs to be able to stabilize this extra electron density once it leaves, which results in a negative formal charge. The next mechanism is a proton transfer, which is the exchange of the hydrogen ion between the electrophile and the nucleophile, where the source of the proton is deprotonated and the compound that receives it is protonated. Here's a proton transfer between hydrochloric acid and an alcohol. Hydrochloric acid is deprotonated and donates a hydrogen ion to the alcohol, who is protonated, resulting in a positive charge on oxygen, who now has three bonds, and in a negative charge on the chlorine, who now carries extra electron density. Here is a reverse reaction, which brings up an important point to remember. Proton transfers are always reversible. The chlorine extracts a proton and forces a deprotonation of the newly formed water molecule which gives you back the alcohol and the hydrochloric acid you started with. When drawing mechanisms, you need to draw them correctly. There are rules on how to draw arrow pushing, and if you don't follow them, you're likely to get points off on your reaction, in addition to them being falsely written. You always draw from electron density to where they're being transferred. Do not draw as if you're directing charges either. Charges aren't tangible. They're just a notation for the amount of or the lack of electron density. They're not the things being transferred, so don't draw your reactions as if they are. The last mechanism is rearrangement, which is simply resonance in a reaction. In the majority of your reactions at this point, rearrangement will be induced by unstable carbocations looking to stabilize themselves. In order to successfully interpret this mechanism, you need to understand carbocation stability, which is shown here. Note that a carbocation will never rearrange itself from a more stable state into a less stable state. So, if your reaction results in a tertiary carbocation at one point, you can rule out rearrangement as a possible next step. Rearrangement can occur by two means, a hydride shift, where a hydride is a hydrogen with two electrons. In this example, we had a secondary carbocation, but after a hydride shift, we now have a tertiary carbocation. It can also occur by a methyl shift, where a methyl from one part of the compound will relieve some of the instability of the carbocation, like the hydride did before. Now SN1 and SN2 stands for Substitution Nucleophilic Reaction, and the subscripts describe what kind of substitution nucleophilic reaction it is. The 1 in SN1 stands for unimolecular, which describes its rate law, which depends on 
only the substrate's concentration. So since this is a first rate reaction, what will happen if you double the substrate concentration? Well, it will double. What will happen when you double the nucleophile concentration? Since it's a unimolecular reaction, it's only dependent on the substrate concentration, so doubling the nucleophile has no effect. So this tells you the step that includes the substrate is the rate determining step of a two-step reaction. The two steps are the loss of the leaving group resulting in a carbocation intermediate which is followed by a nucleophilic attack which attacks the newly formed electrophile. The first step is the rate determining step, the step that only involves the substrate. This step is the slowest, which explains why it essentially dictates the rate of the entire reaction. Tertiary carbocations are the most stable, so SN1 reactions will favor a sterically hindered substrate to result in a stable carbocation. Now remember that a carbocation is a flat molecule, so for the second step, it can be attacked from either side, which will give you a mix of products one with retention of the original configuration and one where the configuration is inverted. This mixture is not racemic and the inverted configuration is favored. When the leaving group detaches, it carries along with it the extra electron density. This crowds the side of the substrate that it detached from, preventing an attack on this side the majority of the time and preventing a retention of configuration. This is why the inverted configuration is favored, because it can be accessed more easily. SN2 stands for Substitution Nucleophilic Reaction as well, but the 2 in SN2 stands for Bimolecular, which describes that the rate law is dependent on both the substrate and the nucleophile concentrations. So what will happen now if I double the substrate concentration? Well, it will double the product concentration. And if I double the nucleophile concentration, it will also double the product concentration. So, this is a second order rate reaction. This should tell you that the two steps that made up SM1 now occur in one single step. Here, the nucleophile is going to attack the electrophile which is the carbon that's highly substituted by the electron withdrawing leaving group and at the same time the leaving group will detach. This means we can only have one type of product, the inversion of configuration, because since the leaving group doesn't leave first the other side is not readily available due to steric hindrance. This should also be noted for the reaction's compatibility with its substrate. SN2 is more reactive with less sterically hindered substrates because the nucleophile is able to attack the electrophile easier if the area around it is not as crowded with electron densities from the other bonded groups. So to recap, both SN1 and SN2 involves two of the four mechanisms we discussed earlier, the nucleophile attack and the loss of the leaving group. The mechanism for an SN2 reaction is a concerted process where these two steps happen simultaneously. Because of this, the rate reaction involves the concentration of the substrate and the nucleophile, since both are present in the one-step reaction, making it a second-order reaction. The rate of the reaction is fastest with less sterically hindered substrates, so the nucleophile can more readily bond with carbon. The products will have an inverted configuration because the leaving group is still bonded to the other side of the carbon and doesn't leave until after the nucleophile has bonded. In the SN1 reaction, these two mechanisms occur in separate steps, where the loss of the leaving group forms the electrophile, which is a carbocation. This is attacked by the nucleophile in the second step. The loss of the leaving group is the rate determining step, the slowest step of the two, which explains why the rate reaction is only dependent on the substrate concentration, making it a first order reaction.
SM1 favors sterically hindered substrates because they will form more stable carbocations after the leaving group detaches. This reaction will give you a mix of products made up of inverted and retained configurations, where the inverted configuration is present in higher percentages because the leaving group's electron density shields one side of the carbocation from being attacked by the nucleophile. Learning and understanding these trends for SN1 and SN2 reactions will not only help you predict the products of SN2 or SN1, but you'll be able to draw the proper mechanism behind it as well.